Hey everybody, welcome back to Pathfinder, Wrath of the Righteous. Uh, last episode, we came back to Galarian and we took control of the Crusades once again. Unfortunately, Galfrey took most of my army and went to Iz all the way over here. And uh, yeah, I had to rebuild from scratch, but uh, things seem to be going pretty good. Liberated a little bit more land and uh, yeah, we're doing uh, we're doing the good old Crusade stuff again, which is nice to see. It's uh, kind of missed it, so yeah, uh, we're going to tie up some loose ends here in the dragon burial site with me and my friends. I got Kislogli around my party as well, so yeah, that's good. So the passage we go back in the dragon land. Hopefully no enemies have respawned and we just walk in with the secrets of the dragon and the door here. A little big bell thing. I guess he figured out how to ring the doorbell. Okay. Oh, uh oh. Then big dragon there and a small dragon. Oh, the black dragon looks evil. But we can't keep the alarm bell silence forever. Have a le let the mess. When it rings, the fury of the metallic dragons will descend upon you. They'll protect the sacred child. I don't need to silence the bell, but I'm going to destroy it. But you won't be alive long enough to witness his destruction. Stop. Stop them. The silver dragon tries to rise, but he's too weak. He he's a priest of Dot Hawk. He wants to take the child. I am Hokugal Ruzifreth, the protector of this cave. I beseech you, help me vanquish him. Protect the child. Black Dragon turns uh, slowly in your direction. There you are, Commander. Right on time. We need to finish off this worm before more of them appear. What child? What are you talking about? The greatest treasure of dragon kind, uh, Jar Sigax Aga Moralandre, the divine offspring. He has been asleep in his egg for centuries, waiting. Waiting to usher in a new era for dragon kind. Look at the bones scattered around you. Uh, the, these are the remains of those who fought for the right to keep the sacred child. And today, the metallic dragons will lose this right. The chromatic dragons will be the new guardians of the divine offspring. Lathamist, you're a dragon? <laughs> Did you enjoy my little charade? I know how you warm bloods feel about black dragons. I can imagine the kind of reception I would have had if I appeared you, uh, to you in my true form. But I didn't lie to you about my work. I wish to, to change the, fu the future of our kind. The metallic dragons are hiding away something that rightfully belongs to all dragons, and I'm here to retrieve it. You've come to seize the child, to make him a monster just like the, your master, Dahak. Do you think you can disguise your true intentions while this talk of fairness? Your soul is run to the core, Evalathamus. Uh, I have some questions. I will answer. Don't listen to him. I will tell you the truth. The truth. You're nothing more than a pawn, Haukugal. You do what you're told and play your rule dutifully, but you know nothing. Uh, so, Lathamus, you're a priest of Dahak. I serve the greatest of dragons, the rageful Dahak, son of Apsu, the one who bre whose breath set hell aflame, the one who shall unseat his father and usher in a new age for Galarian, an age of glorious conflict. <laughs> Doesn't the thought of it fill your soul with longing? At, l at long last, we will unleash the pure rage, fury, and chaos in our hearts. We shall become free. Free, but at what cost? Galarian will be left in ruins. Why would you desire such freedom? No, mortal, don't let him. He wants to use a sacred child to destroy our world. What is the alternative? Order and restraint for all eternity. What a dull existence. You metallics are so afraid of soiling your shiny scales. You fear corruption. You try so hard you always do to always do the right thing. You spend months and months deliberating over the right course of action. Is this your idea of freedom? Ha! There is no freedom without chaos. Apsu made us slaves to order, but Dahak, Dahak shall set us free, and the sacred child will help break, uh, help him break our chains. Okay, uh, why? What does this bell do? Uh, that bell will send a signal to the metallic dragons. Its sound will let them know that the child is in danger. Their presence would complicate matters significantly. Trust me, a fight with them would be a lot harder than beating up a half-dead guardian. You can't break it. The bell's enchantments protect it against dragons like you. Enough. I want to ask something else. Well, I'll make it quick. I have some unfinished business to take care of. Hmm. Oh, I can choose my own side. I take the treasure for myself. Interesting. Uh, oh, the keeper. I'll help you out. Oh, okay. Well, I know nothing about you two dragons, so I guess I'll I'll choose my own side and take the treasure for myself. I guess. I don't know. That's what Mickey Mouse would do, right? Yes. I must must stand against you. Do whatever you want. I don't care. Just kill Hawkgall when I take uh while I take care of the bell. After he's dead, we can discuss the matter further. Okay, sure. Okay, that was easy. Huh. Oh, dragon down. Uh, Alright. Lathamus, anything to say to me? Go and see if the egg is unharmed while I break this bell. Okay, sure. The uh, child. Follow oh, it's a big egg. Oh, that's a humongous egg, huh? Alright, let's go. Big egg. Hey, how you doing, big egg? Oh. oh, it cracked open. As soon as you touch the egg, it cracks. He watches the small, strong winds break through the shell, and then the tiny, iridescent dragon emerges. He stretches as if just woke up from a long slumber and looks at you questioningly with his big, violet eyes. So you're the special, uh, you're, so you're the special lizard, huh? All the dragons want to claim you for their own, but you're my treasure now. Ha ha ha! The dragon hisses indignantly, and his scales darken until they are black as coal. He is watching you closely, and when you look into his eyes, a shiver runs down your spine. This is an ancient, powerful creature, a creature as old as time itself. Okay. 
the bell won't bother us anymore. I'll just take the egg and Lathamis looks stunned. No, this cannot be. He bows his head. Uh, Jarsagas, uh, Agamora, and Alandre, the sacred child, he hatched. But how did this happen? Mm, I touched the egg and he hatched. Lathamis eyes you suspiciously. You touched the egg? Are you telling me that you brought about the event uh, we've been waiting on for centuries with a single touch? What sort of creature are you? You woke a, uh, you, your touch awoke a dragon. My master will be very interested to hear about you. Are you certain that this is a child? He looks like an ordinary dragon. Are you blind? Look at how his scales change color. Look at his eyes. No, this is no ordinary dragon. I can already sense his power. Someday he will be strong enough to create worlds and destroy them. The shifting color of his scales reflect the streams of order and chaos that gave birth to the first gods. He may be young, but his knowledge is beyond your understanding. He possesses the wisdom of the divine. This big name. This seems to be like a very long name for a newborn. Don't forget this is a divine child born in the days of creation. He remained connected to the world during his long years of slumber, and that connection has given him wisdom and experience. Thus, he has earned his long title. <laughs> the entire history of my people flew by in the time it took for him to grow a couple scales. Land chuckles sadly. <laughs> Standing next to this creature, I can't help but feel like an insect in comparison. Dragons protected that egg for centuries, and now it's gone. Is that bad? You've missed the forest for the trees. The egg was never important. It was the dragon inside that mattered. For good or for ill, this dragon will change everything. But I never wait. I witnessed the birth of my lifetime. Oh, I witnessed his. I, I never thought I'd witness his birth during my lifetime. Lathamis looks at you solemnly. A new future awaits. This is a new dawn of a new era for dragonkind. So what happens now? I will look after him. I'll try to take uh, him to my master. He will decide what to do with the child. As for you, you shall receive your reward. Oh yes, the reward you deserve. Uh, Lathamis reaches for the tiny dragon. Ish. Jar uh, Jarxax darts away from Lathamus. He hides behind you, and the scales on his neck rise menacingly. Lathamus withdraws his hand and smiles wryly. It's ironic. After all, my service is a hawk, searching for spells that could weaken the defenses of this world, pitting powerful mortals against each other, and sowing chaos from the shadows. Uh, this guy has chosen uh, someone else. Ha, it really is ironic. His smile twists as a sneer. Well, it doesn't matter. I was going to kill you anyway. Hmm. I think he wants me to become his guardian. The sacred child has made his choice, yes, but that changes nothing. You will join the servants of Dahawk. Step away from the child, and I'll be merciful. I'll make your death swift. Alright, calm down. Think about this logically. You said that this guy is destined to become Dahawk's ally. If that's true, then the child has chosen me, because he knows I will raise him as a warrior of chaos. Hmm, Lathamus' eyes narrows into slits. There is truth to your words. This guy is wise, and if he has decided that you will protect him and raise him, it is not for me to argue. But if Master Darhawk is displeased with this arrangement and demands that I kill you and take the child, I'll carry out his order with great pleasure. Alright, sure. There we go. I was able to convince him to go away. Hmm, interesting. Well, I think that's it for this quest line. Yeah, probably. Dawn of Dragons. Okay, we're here with Ember. We got Alphabet Shrine. This is Ember's companion quest. Let's go. All right, Ember. Ah, I see them. Look, there they are. A demon and Toil is there too, standing in front of him. Uh, standing in front of him. He doesn't look seem scared at all. Bring them to me, Lord Baphomet will be pleased, especially after he sees the blood of the apostates. Oh yes, oh mighty Thasgarad. Did you really think you could just walk away from the cult? You belong to us forever. No one will save you now. Not gods, not people, not even your weak little preacher. They're quarreling again. Why do some people understand things when they're explained, but others don't? There's a new, unfamiliar undercurrent in Amber's voice. For the first time since you've met her, she seems genuinely angry. Let's go over there, Mickey Mouse. Hurry. The redeemed knights can't hold up for long. Uh, they need your help and the, these stupid Templars. How can I make them see that they're wrong? All right. You still hope to persuade the Templars to repent? Maybe not. It seems some good people just don't understand good words. Oh, interesting. Sparks flicker in her eyes and a small flame dance in the tip of her fingers. You can't help but shudder as you realize how formidable this fragile elven girl has suddenly become. Forward, slaves of Baphomet. Prove to the master that you're worthy to serve him. Hold on, redeemed. Don't take a single step back. We have no right to lose this battle. Don't give up. We're on our way. Okay, here we go. We're going to save the, I guess, the followers of Ember. <laughs> Alright, let's do this. Oh, Lord Baphomet, smite those pitiful freaks. You're the pathetic ones. Run now as fast as you can. Save yourselves while you're still able, for Baphomet will not save you. They say the righteous have endless patience, yet you still manage to anger her. Better run now. Oh, flame strike. Forgive us. We renounce Baphomet. Okay. Oh, there, he's dead. Oh, I didn't need to buff up. Oh, never mind. Maybe I do. Okay, maybe I do. <laughs> Lunch time. Let's dine on mortal flesh. Oh, hello. With a carefree smile, Ember with the demons. I remember you. We met in the Purple City. She looks like one of the demons, a frail creature whose horns have been broken off. How are your wounds? All healed up. It's that lunatic from Lucianera. Remember that crazy mortal who preached to us? Yeah, it's her, all right. You know what? Go ahead and slit her uh, my throat. Eat me. Do whatever, but I'm not gonna kill her. Ah, uh, come and join our side. Let's put an end to this war together. That's right. Demons, mortals, we can all be friends. She's right, you know. What's the point of all this never-ending slaughter? Keep fighting the whole world if you want, but I'm done. Screw this invasion, screw the world wound, and screw Baphomet twice over. Are you crazy? I'm gonna make you wish you never said that. 
Go on, then kill me. Life in the abyss is no life at all. The girl was right. Better to live five minutes among mortals than return there with you, scum. Peace with mortals. Down with Baphomet. Friends, thank you. We won't let anyone hurt you. Thank you, little preacher, for opening our eyes. The demon turns to her former allies and bears teeth. Well, who wants to be the first to attack the demon crusader? <laughs> oh, okay. Interesting. Do we just keep going? Oh, we keep going down. I'm gone. Oh, wait, no. Amber's going that way. That's enough! The elf's fearsome shout echoes over the battlefield. All present crusaders, templars, even demons, lower their weapons and turn to her in surprise. Enough of this nonsense. I've talked about goodness for so long, over and over. I told them that all mortals should help each other, and they believed me. Some received my words, passed them on to others, and it was enough to open their eyes. But you, she points to the templars with her charred fingers, you are blind and deaf to good words. Some people do not understand good words. I did not want to believe it. The commander was right. Some people will not change their ways unless they are punished. A gust of wind, hot wind ruffles her hair. I'm sorry I have to do this to you. If only you had listened to me before. Oh. She's got magic powers. Forgive us, girl. Forgive us. We didn't know what we were doing. Don't listen to this mortal fool. Bring me her head. Uh, you're done for, demon. Today you'll die at the hands of mortals. Bold words for a piece of me. Come on. Does anyone need to me to repeat my words? I'll devour the soul of anyone who dares raise a weapon against me. And I'll start with the traitors. I will no longer serve you. Curse you and your Baphomet. Down with Baphomet. Down with the Templars. If we die today, we die as Crusaders. I will devour your bodies and souls, and I'll start with this little piece of fluff with the baleful glare of ember. The demon raises his hand, and a ball of ghostly flames starts to form between them. Uh oh. That's like, oh, it's Noctacula. Get your paws off her, you scaly filth. Emerging out of nowhere, Noctacula moves a finger, and the demon starts writhing in pain. She glances around the battlefield with interest. So, what have we here? The preaching of a barefoot little beggar stops a battle and makes sinners repent and turns demons to the side of good. How very interesting. I confess, girls, your words have failed to impress me in Illusionera, but your deeds, they are intriguing. The demon lord glances at the redeemed demons. Hey, you rebels, what does this mean? Do you fear this tiny mortal more than Baphomet, Discari, and all other demons in the abyss? We will be displeased by your betrayal. No, Lady in Shadow, the voice of the demon is quiet but firm. We are not afraid of her or them. We are no longer afraid of anything. We've been afraid of our entire lives, but this mortal girl has healed our fear. Kill us if you want, but we will no longer follow anyone's orders. The demon frowns, expecting a punishment that never comes. Dr. Kila looks at you thoughtfully. It is not often I come across uh, things that I do not understand. Would you be so kind to explain what this girl thinks she's doing? She already explained everything to you. Remember what she said to you the last time she met. I recall a great deal of crying and sniffling with some incoherent rambling between the sobs. What exactly was that supposed to explain to me? You there, child. What is this all supposed to mean? How do you make these hardened scoundrels, these blasphemers, and then murderers with blood dripping from their hands repent? What makes even demons who've scarcely crawled out of the abyss take your side? The Redeemer Queen. Hello. Thank you for protecting me. <laughs> Amber smiles and waves at Nectakila who recoils. Why are you asking? Uh, you already know the answer. You're already just afraid to accept it. Don't be afraid. What nonsense. First, don't you dare call me by that idiotic nickname. Second, I am afraid of nothing. Third, please do not think of me as your personal bodyguard from now on. The only reason I didn't allow you to uh, allowed him to burn you was because I, un I wanted to understand what's going on here, and interrogating a pile of ashes would be a trifle inconvenient. You don't seriously think your sickly sweet whining would make me relinquish my demon lord throne, do you? You already know the answer, Redeemer Queen. I see you are not the same as you were in the Purple City. You have changed. In the name of all that is unholy, the demoness rolls her eyes. What was I thinking? What kind of answers would I expect from this feeble-minded creature? Dr. Kula, why did you come here? I asked myself the same question. I think I wanted to understand why hardened murderers and bloodthirsty demons suddenly started eating out of the insane beggar's hand, but what's the use in trying to understand the ravings of a lunatic? The only reward for my curiosity was a headache. Hmm, how did you know that what was going on here? I have eyes everywhere, and I, have a, uh, I keep a close eye on you and your gang. I knew it. You sent your friends to look after me and keep me from harm. I had a feeling they were protecting me. Protect you? Who do you think you are, you mortal idiot? If you want, go ahead and jump off this cliff head first. I won't lift a finger to save you. But you already have saved me, just now. For this first and second, for the first and last time in your short, meaningless life. Uh, so that's your new title, the Redeemer Queen. The next person who calls me that risk becoming acquainted with my collection of torture implements. Since you're already here, perhaps you could help us with the battle. As if, do your own fighting with a contemptuous snort, Noctakila disappears. And we're happily claps her hands. Good queen. She pretends not to understand, but she understands everything. Her laughter is interrupted by the howl of the demon who finally recovered. Looks like everyone's brains have already melted. Doesn't matter. I'm strong enough alone to devour every wall. Glory to Baphomet, death's immortals. Oh, she's all the way up there, huh? Alright, nice. Alright. All got them all? So strangely. Oh. We've killed many people. We've saved many people. These knights came here to kill each other, but instead, they became friends. Yeah, happy ending. I, surprisingly. I'm so sorry I had to punish them. I didn't want anyone to be good only because they feared punishment. And I don't want people to be afraid of me. But what else could I do if they wouldn't listen to me and kept fighting and everyone would die? Turns out, 
punishment saved them. You told me it was true, and I didn't believe you, but you were right. Yeah, Mickey Mouse is always right. And those demons, back in the Purple City, they laughed at my words, but I saw they were listening. I believed they would one day remember my words and understand them. And it happened. If humans can stop being evil, so can demons. Even demon lords, like the Redeemer Queen. <laughs> the Redeemer Queen? So you think Noctilla is on the path of good? Of course. She is very proud. She'd never say it out loud. But I see that she has changed. You know, I pray to the demon lords every day and ask them to come to their senses. Descari and Baphomet don't listen to me, but she... She's different. I know she hears everything. Maybe one day, not soon, but one day, she will get out of the abyss. What happened to the Redeemed Brotherhood next? Their numbers will increase. They will be joined by new people who have mended their ways. Good people who still think they have been abandoned and have no choice but to be evil. They'll help each other get out of the abyss. And they'll defeat those who have chosen to stay there. Oh, that's cool. The redeemed knights want me to go with them, to teach and guide them. But I can't. I frightened these good people. I did it because I had to, but now they're scared of me. And I don't want anyone to be afraid of me. I know that sometimes fear can save someone's soul. But if I get used to frightening people, it will kill my soul. I need to stay away from them. Oh, sure. What kind of fire spell did you use there? This trick... Soot told me about it, but I didn't want to use it. It's scary. Even I'm scared when I do it. I'm sorry I had to. But if I hadn't scared those good people, we would have had to kill them all, wouldn't we? If people weren't so silly, we could have just talked to them. But they are very, very silly. So sometimes... We have to do scary things. Hmm, okay. Well, another battle behind us. It's time to prepare for the ones ahead. Wait, what do you think? About me? About these knights? About everything that's happened? Um, the right to call you Saint Ember, and Ember the Righteous. <laughs> now you're saying that too. <laughs> but I know I'm entirely ordinary. You've taught me a lot of things. Sometimes you were stern, but that's a good thing. Because you were right, and I was wrong. Now I also know how to be stern when it's needed. Thank you. Aw, oh, that's so nice. <laughs> that's a great ending. <laughs> a really great ending. Okay, wow, yeah, great. Uh, you see a Gurundi woman wearing the loose robes of a priest. Her hair looks like it was recently shorn. And then she looks bald, what the heck? And it was only starting to grow back. She wears a holy symbol of Phrasma on her neck, but it's plain and cheaply made. However, she carries herself with dignity and looks at you in the eye without fear. Priestess of Phrasma, your uninvited guest, uh, speaks with a strange accent. Her voice is throaty and hoarse, but easily understandable. Do not reach for your weapon. I'm not here to make war, but to give you a warning. Your sins are many, and when you stand before the Lady of Graves, uh, you will be judged harshly in accordance with your transgressions. My mistress Phrasma wishes to inform you of her displeasure and demands that you stop meddling in the forbidden matters of death, lest you incur her wrath while you are still living, such is her word. The woman delivers the, uh, the warning in a calm and different manner, but you detect a note of sadness in her voice. Who are you? The woman shakes her head. I have been sent by the Lady of Graves. You do not need to know my name or the name of the land where I was born. I am simply the messenger of a higher power. The message is important, but the tale of the mortal who carries it is irrelevant. Uh, what exactly does Phrasma want me to do? Uh, do not disturb the dead, do not create restless spirits, and do not practice forbidden magic. Do not rip souls from their place in the cycle, and do not steal from the river of souls. Denounce necromancy and only practice magic that upholds the order established by Phrasma. Repent uh, of your transgressions and obey these precepts. You have committed many atrocities, and now you must atone for them. What will happen if I don't listen to you? The priestess looks to you in surprise, as if you are a particularly slowly witted child. The servants of my goddess uh, shall don the garments of war, and will personally escort your soul to the final judgment. Ah, uh, can we strike a deal, uh, or come to some sort of arrangement? You detect a note of arrogance in the priestess's voice. My mistress does not bargain. My mistress commands, and the verdicts of the one who created the river of souls itself must be obeyed without question, such as the order of the world. Ugh. Alright, fine. Oh, I can do this. <laughs> uh, turn the foolish priestess into an undead. I won't let you return to your mistress, you blabbering filth. Let's do this. Magic engulfs a priestess as she crumples like a discarded puppet. Her bones crunch and snap, her joints crack. 
but your power cannot touch the woman's soul. You try to poison her with unlife, but Phrasma's blessing protects the priestess's soul like an invisible, impenetrable shield. Uh oh. That's not good. The woman's body twitches and her breathing is shallow and ragged, but her voice is still cold and indifferent. I shall relay your answer to my mistress. When she summons me to her judgment, your atrocities will soon be at an end. I look into your soul and pronounce your doom. The priestess's body falls limp, but you can feel the icy claws of her dying curse latch onto your soul. Ah, damn. That's not good. <laughs> uh, greater curse of idiocy. No. All right, apparently I have to warn the Pillar of Skulls. I, vis I was visited by a priestess of Phrasma. She warned me that I had incurred the wrath of the Lady of Graves. This news is unsettling. Many powerful spirits serve Phrasma. The Ziggurat will be fortified. However, you can take advantage of her wrath. Time and again, necromancers have challenged the Lady of Gra Graves. The battle with her will help you rise in the esteem of the other Adepts of Death. Her attention and frustration is a sign of your greatness. Hell yeah. Command, and we shall let you uh, know how to handle Phrasma's wrath and insult her in a way she won't be able to ignore. So how does Phrasma's wrath pose a danger to us? Complete destruction. The Lady of Graves of Depths are many, and yet they're scattered and far away. Phrasma's worshippers could organize a shining crusade against you, but fighting both you and demons at once would prove challenging. It is reasonable to assume that instead of her mortal adepts, Phrasma will retaliate using the powers of the psychopomps that dwell in her domain, the Boneyard. What are you proposing? Naturally, your deeds do not go unnoticed, but Phrasma is one of the oldest. To her, mortal lives are fleeting. She may find it easier to punish you when your soul faces judgment instead of sending her troops to wage war. Yet, if you achieve the immortality promised by Master Zacharias, you'll be able to continue breaching Phrasma's laws for all eternity, leaving the Lady of Graves no other choice but to send her legions of spirits after you. Hmm, okay, sure. Interesting. So, re be reborn as a true lich. Gods are uh, gods are eternal and mortal creatures whose existence can span multiple eons, which is why few of them possess the vice of impatience. The Lady of Graves can delay her retribution until the arrogant mortal dies and faces her judgment. But if the commander completes the ritual and becomes a lich, he will no longer be mortal, and thus he'll be free to trespass against Phrasma's laws until the end of eternity. The Lady of Graves will not tolerate such blasphemy. Huh, okay, cool, cool, cool. I just upgrade the ziggurat to that, so, huh, unfortunate. That Grace, how's the progress? Anything to say? I was visited by Phrasma's priestess, who gave me a warning from her goddess. Ah, the Lady of Graves is forever prying into the affair of those who seek to uncover the mysteries of death. She is immortal and un yet unwilling to let others enjoy eternity. Immortality is a treasure she and her cronies will defend most jealously, so be careful. Okay, cool. Okay, so we're here at uh, the Shrine of Plura, or the Plura's Falls. I think this is the place where Mutasafin is. So, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, there it is. There's some enemies up there. All right, let's buff up, get ready for a big old battle. All right, let's, uh, let's check this area. Oh, oh. Oh, look, it's Mutasafin. And... Oh, are those the prisoners? The Desna Dreamers? Ah, it's you again. The demon flips through the pages of an angry tome with a bored expression. He does not seem at all surprised by your arrival. Sorry, I'm busy right now. I don't have time to chat. You have to find something else to do. For example, try and save these fools over there. Commander, you're here. Praise Desna. Hey, it's Ramian. He got caught. <laughs> Stop the demon. Don't let him steal the secret tomes. They contain all the information who gathered up the world wound with knowledge like that. He can. Yeah. Oh, you gotta portal them. You talk too much, bored now. Let's spice things up. You either save those idiots or chase after me. Mutasafin makes a subtle gesture, and the sanctuary erupts on flames at the same time a portal opens up behind him. Uh, I... look, I'm sorry guys, but Mickey Mouse, he likes knowledge too much. Alright, knowledge is power, and not power. Mickey Mouse loves power. I can't let you leave with such dangerous knowledge. Stop Mutasafin. Oh, the spell. Oh, I can dispel them. Stop that scumbag commander. I'll help the rest. Goddess, give me strength. Oh, wait, Ramian? Oh, look at that. He actually just, oh, he just put water, <laughs> he poured water. Oh no, Rami, <laughs> no, moth flying into the flames. How symbolic. No, Ramian's dead. What the hell? I'll slap you down. Pop, 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 pop. Oh, wow, he's so weak, actually. Might be trapped. Might be treasure. Ah, okay. Never mind. That's all it took. All right, Mujusafing actually can revive himself, right? I think he can bring himself back. Ah, uh, okay. The battle is won. Is that, are you, can I talk to you? Eliandra, a regal Asimar dressed uh, in priestess robes, bows her head. She has a proud, dignified bearing, but she looks tired. Greetings, I'm Eliandra, the high priestess of Pulara. Thank you for coming to save my shrine. Tell me about your research. What is it about? What did Mustafasin want to steal it? That research is our life's work, that research answers bitterly. We have studied the world wound for a hundred years. We've been searching for a way to close it, but the demon wanted our research for a different purpose. He aspires to follow in Aurelu Vorlush's footsteps. He wants to open a wound of his own. He believed that our research would help him accomplish that goal. Thank you for putting an end to his evil schemes. We worked so hard over the past hundred years. Cannot bear if our research ended up in the wrong hands. Uh, I'd like to see your research if it could prove useful. You're welcome to our research. We're grateful that you kept it from falling into the wrong hands. I hope our knowledge will serve a good cause. You'll find everything you need on the bookshelves behind me. Tell me about this place. This is Pularis Falls. Once there was a real waterfall here, you could hear the song of the 
water as it flowed across the stones. But then the world wound came and stole it all away. The servants of the Shimmering Maiden took the shelter here when Sakura's fell. My lady hid this place from our unfriendly eyes and prolonged the lives of everyone inside so that we could dedicate ourselves to an important mission. I'm studying the world wound since the day it came into existence. I was like over 100 years old. So you were alive when the world wound was open. What do you know of its creation? More than some, but not as much as I would wish. I've come to the th I've been to the threshold of the fortress where outlawed spellcasters were held and where Elrilu conducted her monstrous ritual. I even saw the betrayer in the flesh, though only briefly. Rumor uh, really was rumored to be a dangerous witch. For many years, she had lived in isolation, carrying out strange experiments in deliberate obscurity, but she was noticed in the end. The best witch hunters tried to capture her, but it said that many of them perished in the attempt. But when I saw her, she was no longer a dangerous enemy. After many, many days in a dungeon, she was nothing more than a pale shadow. I was told that her spirit was already broken when she brought us brought to the threshold, and she gave the guards no trouble. However, I think it's safe to say now that her, co her compliance was simply a ruse, a cunning deception. When the wound opened and shook the world, my lady Puluara, in her heavenly wisdom, was one of the first to realize the magnitude of the threat, and sent her priest a vision along with an order to, burn, to run and hide. But many couldn't find it within themselves to obey this order. How could they leave their beloved homeland, their homes, family, and friends? Many of my brothers and sisters perished, losing a hopeless fight against wave after wave of demons. I was destined for a distant fate, and so was my shrine. Lady Pulora hid it from the eyes of the demons. I had a vision telling me about the work that needed to be done to avenge the fall of Sakoras and rid the world of the world wound. That was when I learned that this difficult task would take a century to complete, and that it would require us to make any sacrifices, but I was willing. So what will happen to the sanctuary now? It breaks my heart to leave this place, but we cannot stay here. The sanctuary was protected by the secrets the secrecy of its location, but now that the demons know about the temple, this is no longer a place of refuge. I will leave the survivors somewhere safe, but I cherish the hope that we will return. Someday our waterfalls will sing again. All right, farewell, Commander. Polaris children will remember you. Ah, hell yeah. All right, so I can search the bookshelves. Scientific research of Polaris archaeologists can be found in these shelves. The books and scrolls contain meticulously detailed observations about the movements of the celestial bodies. Oh, damn, I can't save. Damn, Ram Ramian is just a blood splatter now. Ah, that's so sad. The demons didn't touch my sketchbook. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, I guess that's that's it then here. Although Mutasafin is probably gonna be back soon. All right, uh, we're in, in all the way here to the left side of the map. Uh. We've reached pretty far uh, away from Pulura's Fall. Now we're here in the city in the wasteland. It's, uh, oh, it's a, oh, it's a book. It's a warm, sunny day in this wound, perhaps too warm and sunny. The Sarkorian wastelands are roasting in the heat of the purple, shimmering sun. Even demonic plants are unable to survive here. They suffocate in the red dust of the plains. A hot wind sweeps across the wasteland, leaving the commander with the taste of ash and sulfur in his mouth. The commander can see for miles around in every direction. If there are any near enemies nearby, they would not be able to sneak up on him unnoticed. However, it does not look like anyone has survived the excruciating heat in the wound. The only sign of life is the sound of insects buzzing nearby. Their chittering noises like harsh, rasping laughter. The heat causes the air to shimmer slightly, and through the haze, the commander notices the walls of a city rising up a short distance from the road. Is this a lost Sarkorian city, a demonic trap, or just a trick of the mind? All the walls look real, but perhaps they are only a mirage. The commander realizes that it is impossible to tell from this distance, so he decides to explore the mysterious city. Hell yeah. The walls are partially buried in red sand, and as the commander draws closer, he realizes it's not a city, but the sun-bleached remains of Sarkorian settlement. The buzzing grows louder, and the commander can see Vescavores perched on the stone slabs as they bask in the sun. The husks of their dead kin crunch beneath the commander's feet with every step. The commander notices rotten wooden pillars covered in faded Sarkorian runes. The tops of the pillars have been gnawed into sharp points, making them look like long wooden stakes. The, uh, the highest of these pillars seem to be a signpost of the middle of what, they, uh, what used to be on busy crossroads. The passage of time has worn away all but these words on the signpost. Square, marketplace, and gem. The commander decides to... In perception with Lan. Lan examines the house uh, closely. It looks like a battle took place here. The walls of the houses have been damaged or destroyed, and all that is left of the roofs is a few wooden beams. When the commander turns his attention to the insects, he notices that the, all the vescovores seem to be flying in a single direction towards the city square. Ah, uh, man, I have my world. I can try. Nope, I failed. Mickey Mouse looks around, but sees nothing that could shed any light on the city's past. I guess we go to the square. The wind, the winding streets that leads to the square, is lined with partially destroyed uh, houses. Many of the, uh, many of them only have three walls, and others are nothing more than a pile of rubble. The commander notices more and more vesicles flying around, and the air is filled with a strange, acrid smell. Uh, the the square is completely empty, but the doors of Gazrez Temple swing open. A woman emerges uh, through them and begins to limp toward the commanders. She strips the waist and looks as though insects are squirming beneath her skin. Liver Mortis has discolored her withered, shriveled flesh, turning it a blotchy purple color. She uh, opens her mouth to speak, but those words come out in a low buzz that is neither masculine nor feminine. Verbovizor welcomes you, esteemed guest. Please make yourself at home. The woman falls silent and then collapses to the ground. A small swarm of Vescovores flies out of her motionless corpse. The insects hover near the commander as if waiting for him to follow them. The commander 
Oh, jeez. Okay. I guess we follow the swarm. <laughs> the swarm flies through the air, unhindered by the obstacles on the ground. The commander has to climb over debris and walk over partially collapsed oil buildings to follow the buzzing insects. Finally, the swarm flies down into a blissfully cool dark hole beneath one of the walls. It does not look large enough for a person to fit through. The commander decides to okay, perceive again. Uh, Lan feels along the sides of the wall and finds a hidden door. He presses a nearby stone, triggering a mechanism that causes the door to swing open. The creaking sound, the cool, damp air of the underground passage feels good against the commander's hot skin, but the chittering of the vesicles has become even more intense. Uh, the commander finds himself in a labyrinth of underground passages. These are obviously not natural caverns, although the stonework of the underground aqueduct, quite a rarity for Sarkoris, is almost completely hidden under a layer of swarming vescovores. The walls, the ceilings, and the floor squirm and move around like bowels of a living creature. The insects block all the passages except for one, and this passage is growing smaller by the minute, prompting the commander to move faster. The passage ends abruptly, and the commander finds himself staring in down into a huge well. The passage is dimly lit, and the bottom of the well is lost beneath beneath its impenetrable darkness. This could be the area beneath the uh, water tower, but it is impossible to know for sure without a map of the city's underground passages. The well is filled with the sound of buzzing vescovores, and the commander can smell their sweet scent wafting up from the darkness. The smell reminds him of the sweet caramel sold at Canabras, the city's festival. Memories of that day come flooding back. For a moment, the commander feels as though he's uh, back in the town square. As if in the answer to his thoughts, the giant figure of Descari rises up from the depths of the well. Suddenly, a crossbow bolt pierces the demon lord, and the figure dissipates into thousands of swarming vescovores. Both Descari and the bolt were formed out of insects. More scenes flash before the commander's eyes. Ash and smoke fills the skies before, uh, during the battle for Dresden, leaving a sour taste on the commander's tongue. Uh, both familiar and unfamiliar people and places appear for a moment and then vanish. It is as if some unknown creature is trying to see into the commander's mind and access his memories. If the creature seems tentative and cautious, almost as if seeking the commander's permission. The commander decides that it is time to... Aw, oh, man. If I had a swarm mythic pack, that's interesting. Uh, sure, allow the hive mind of the Vescovors into my consciousness. Let's see what happens. Hmm. The commander allows a swarm to enter his mind, and suddenly has a vision that feels so real. It's almost like a memory. The commander is standing in Dresden, or is a Canabras, or maybe even Erosian. In the vision, he is watching the sunset over the city of Dresden, or Canabras, or Erosian. A priest of some unknown deity approaches the commander, the priest. The commander isn't sure if it's a man or woman, has no face, there's only a mouth where its face should be. And when the mouth speaks, its words only the buzzing of thousands of insects. We are Verbovisor. Above Vezor has heard about the one who defeated the mighty demon lords. It harbors a special hatred toward Daskari and would like to know about, about his weaknesses. It wishes to fight this demon lord and defeat him. We okay, ask who Ver, uh, Verbal Vezor is and where it's from. The answer does not come immediately. Then the commander sees the purple skies of the abyss cover the city of Dresden or Tsukanabras and Erosian. Verbal has spent years gnawing the flesh of fallen demon lords, but now a man from Demora, the city of Great Hers, has summoned it to fight the barbarians, a pathetic bunch of mortal thugs. Verbovizor crawls up from the depths, and when the mortal fool opens the way into Galarian, Verbovizor flies up and devours the city it was summoned to defend. It leaves behind a hollow shell, a city of empty streets and silent buildings. The city walls will lure passing travelers into a deadly trap. But silence is not what the swarm craves. There is no life, no thought in the silence. Verbovizor wants to understand everything. It wants to comprehend Galarian to make it part of itself. It wants to become Galarian, just as it has become the city. It wants to incorporate all of Galarian's essence, all of its life, into itself. But there are some obstacles. There are those who wish to plunge Galarian into oblivion. Verbovazor hates Tuscari. It hates Baphomet. They must be destroyed. In the commander's vision, the sound of cicadas fill the air and the sun uh, sinks below the horizon. They grow louder and more impatient, echoing of the noise of the agitated vescovores in the wall. The commander tries to focus and... Hmm. Okay. I'll bluff. Day passes into night, and then night becomes day. Verbovazor thanks the commander politely for telling the truth. Okay, I lied though, and promises to help the commander in battle if he continues to be a good ally. Verbovazor assures the commander that it will remember his scent and come when needed. The commander chooses to accept the swarm's help. Hell yeah. The swarm swells in size and gently lifts up the commander, carrying him from the depths of the well into the light. As soon as the commander touches the hard, parched earth, the swarm of insects recedes. As the commander passes by the residents of the city, they twitch and move like puppets on a string. He hears the crunch of a bone and the squelch of internal organs as their bodies contort into strange and unnatural obeisances. The commander has undoubtedly gained a reliable new ally in the world wound. Oh, I got a friend. Nice. Huh. Cool. That's nice. I have no idea what that does, actually. Okay. I guess we continue adventuring then, huh? Oh, it's Gershmura. Looks the same as before, but far more worried, so it's true. The commander has returned from the dead. We've heard all manner of rumors, but we do not know what to believe. 
so I came here. Uh, so wait, uh, but so I came here to be sure. Uh, to be sure if it's true and not or not whether uh, this is another trick of the demons. Oh, okay. What's the news from Winter Sun? I thought time would heal Winter Sun, but it hasn't been easy. People gradually return to their lives, but the mere sight of their homeland brought back memories of the atrocities. This is why, when the demons returned, we didn't fight the way we should have. Oh, okay, interesting. Right, I forced our about to destroy the malicious magic. Right, right, right. The surrounding woods seem to have taken mercy on us and sent animals to our aid, and they tirelessly fought the demon invaders. We only survived because of them. So what will you do now? We will leave in search of a better life. The place we called home, all these centuries no longer accept us. There are too many ghosts here, too many memories. I do not know where we'll go, but I'll pray to the spirits that the new place will accept us. Farewell, uh, Gesmera. Farewell, Commander. May the spirits watch over you. I hope our paths will cross again someday. Yeah, sure. I hope so, too. And Camellia. My friend, I should like to request your help. Camellia's face remains calm, but her voice trembles with excitement. Uh-oh. Remember how much fun we had with Lushnira? We went to another brothel. We went to a brothel together and had an excellent time there. You did enjoy that little adventure of ours, didn't you? Camilla licks her parched lips. I wish to invite you to go on another adventure with me. You wouldn't be opposed to escorting me to Canabras, to my father's old mansion, the place where I spent my childhood. She lowers her voice to a conspiratorial whisper. I'm certain that is the place where I shall finally be able to connect, uh, contact Mireya. Why to Canabras specifically? Because it is what I want, understand? My desire alone must be enough for you. Camellia stops. A shadow of fear crosses her face, but she immediately hides it from behind a modest smile. It seems I lost control over myself. I apologize. Over the past few days, I've expended great effort trying to summon Maria and make her talk. The exertion has taken its toll on me. The Gwerm Mansion is in Canabras, where I grew up as a special place. It wasn't extraordinary before, but has become so for me. It is where I learned to communicate with spirits and barked on the path of the shaman. It is where I took Maria prisoner and bound her to my amulet. I am positive that is where I finally managed to get muster all my strength and break the wall Maria has built against me. So what are we going to do there? Camellia shrugs graciously. We shall, we shall try to find a comfortable place for mediation, meditation, and I shall summon Maria's spirit. I don't know yet exactly how this can be done, but I believe I shall be able to figure it out once we're there. Okay, fine. Uh, we'll go to Canabras as soon as I have time to spare. Camellia's black eyes shimmer like two lakes on a moonlit night. Thank you, friend. I shall await your earliest convenience. Okay, that's uh, Camellia's thing then. Hopefully she doesn't kill her dad. Uh, okay, I'm, uh, I'm back in Chili Creek. We're going to go check out... Uh-oh. We're gonna go check out this quest here. Jerna, Commander. The cleric is lying on the river bank. Uh, the sand is soaked with his blood. Save, save Melissa. What happened to you? The, the village, so peaceful, so beautiful, so peaceful. So many good people living here. But something has been worrying me since the day I came here. I couldn't stop thinking about all the strange rituals in the grove and all the weird conversations about firstborns being doomed to die. I tried not to think too much about it. The villagers were not willing to embrace the faith of Rastil. I didn't want to appear judgmental, but I was wrong. I should have trusted my instincts. There is great evil at work in this village. When Melissa and I decided to get married, she told me she wanted to do it under the rights of Rastil. I hadn't asked her to do that, but she had already made up her mind. It was entirely her decision. She asked me not to tell Markle about it, and we tried to keep things quiet, but he found out about it in any ways. While he grew more and more gloomy with every passing day, I did not understand what was going on until Melissa finally told me the truth, something that everyone else in the village knew except for me. Locals perform the wedding rites upstream from the isle on boat. The bride is supposed to take off her wreath and send it, flowing, uh, and send it floating down the stream while she recites a horrible profane oath that I do not wish to repeat. You see, when she gives away her wreath, she also promises to give her firstborn to the river, body, mind, and soul. It may not happen right away, it may take years, but in the end the river will always take what belongs to it. And Markle, he's a few minutes older than Melissa. Do you see? The dying man whispers hoarsely. You can hear the anguish in his voice. The people of Chili Creek believe that they worship the river, but these rites, rit rites are not druidic in nature. They are not rituals of the green faith or the cultic practices of some minor deity. No, this malevolent force, whatever it is, it has a physical presence in this world. Markle has lost his mind. His parents swore to give him to this monster, and now it has deprived him of his sanity. He took Melissa to the isle, and that's probably where the monster lives and where the sacrifices to it are being made. So the locals sacrifice their first ones to the river and the bridal wreath is part of the ritual? Not exactly. The locals are decent people. They don't kill their children with their own hands. The wreath is a sign of obedience. The future parents agree that the river can take their firstborns whenever it wants. It has the right to take their bodies or their minds. It can summon them at any time and demand services from them. And sometimes the river exercises that right. That's, uh, there's more. Markle was a firstborn son, the older twin. When he did this to me, he wasn't himself anymore. I believe that the river took control of him. Whatever monster the locals worship has been controlling his thoughts and actions. What must I do to save Melissa? Markle took her to Pikefin. It's an isle in the middle of the river. You can see it from here. Indeed, if you look closely, you can see a small rocky isle partially obscured in the river mist. Something drove him insane. The evil that has controlled this village for all these years, it lives on this isle. Take one of the boats from the village and set her free. Okay, uh, you need help. No, it is too late for me. I can already hear Arrestel's hunting horn. My god is waiting for me. All I ask is that you save my wife, my journey through this world. 
The cleric can barely speak. He coughs up blood and continues weakly. My journey is over. So you've been gravely injured. Who did this to you? Okay, I did this to you. Okay, and a farewell journey off. Rest in peace. Save her. Okay. The cleric's breath is shallow and ragged. His quivering lips go still. His eyes close and he passes away to his god. Damn. That sucks, bro. Jernal was there for me like during the early days of Canabras, if I remember correctly. If I think, right? Everyone else in the village dead. Oh god, no. They're still here. Markle did was nothing but he used to be such a nice guy. He never even got drunk. <laughs> okay. Markle was such a nice guy, huh? Poor Jarnal. I miss his tales of the crusade. How terrible. A murder. Nothing like that ever happened in the village before. Okay. Well, I guess if there's nothing else to do here, then I guess I go in to the river. What is more dangerous, the unpredictability of nature or the hostile intentions of another? The malevolent force hiding on this island, isle is as wild, volatile, and ruthless as the natural world, but it also has a cunning intelligence, a devious and vindictive desire to keep away unwanted visitors. As soon as the commander reaches the, for the oars, the water around the boat turns to a thick sheet of ice that freezes the vessel in place. What will the commander do now? Uh, I can try to break the ice with my weapon. Yes. The solid ice is strong, but metal is stronger. After a good deal of slashing and hacking, the boat is finally free from its icy shackles. The commander sets off to the shore on the uh, small rocky isle, but his journey does not go unnoticed, and it seems that as someone on the isle does not like uninvited guests. Suddenly, the mist that rises from the surface of the river thickens into a dense cloud of fog. It blinds the commander and obscures his surroundings. Where is the shore? Where is the isle? The fog is so thick and the commander cannot even see the oar he is holding in his hands. What will the commander do now that he is blinded by fog? I can perceive. Close my eyes. It's time to navigate by sound rather than by sight. The sound of running water, the splash of a fish, the wind rustling through the branch of the forest, the sound of a bird chirping on the shore far away, all of these sounds paint a picture in the commander's mind that no fog can hide. A light breeze slowly begins to dissipate the cloud of fog. The boat is heading straight toward the island. It will not be long before the commander reaches the black, uh, rocky shore of the Pike Fin. The rocky isle is desolate and bare. Blue-gray lichen and a few sparse straggling weeds are all that survived on its black rocky shore. Further inland, the entrance to a cave gapes open like a toothless mouth. Suddenly, a violent gust of wind sweeps out from the entrance of the cave toward the river. The water, which was calm only moments ago, begins to swell into massive form foaming waves that threaten to smash the boat into the boulders along the coast. How will the commander reach the shore and intimidate? <laughs> Call out to the unseen force that casts the spell and demand to be allowed into the isle. The commander's intimidating presence seems to frighten the storm into submission. The wind grows calm and the waves subside. He steers the boat down and river toward the isle and disembarks it without any further complications. It is hard to believe that only moments ago this calm, lazy river was a maelstrom of raging waves and, and rushing currents. The air is still peaceful. Uh, how the howling gales and roaring winds have completely subsided. The isle looks calm, but so did the river. Looks can be deceiving. The lichen covered black boulders along the shore do not look like they have been disturbed. It would be easy to assume that this isle is uninhabited. There are no bones or traces of any rituals. But after moving further inland, the commander sees Markle's boat. It has been carefully pulled up onto the shore beyond the reach of the waves. Noises can be heard from within the cave overhead. There's a shrill, angry voice, followed by the sound of a woman's scream. Uh oh. It's gonna be a water hag, isn't it? Let's do this. Oh, I see it. Loretta. How you doing, Loretta? Oh, there's three of them. The cave is cold and dark. The ground is covered in fog and an icy current of air flows towards you from the depths of the cave. Water drifts on the ceiling and dim lantern lanterns cast grotesque shadows on the walls. All these years, we've been worshipping the three of you. All our prayers to the icy rill. All our sacrifices, oh gods, and our children. It's been you the whole time. Melissa is huddled in a corner, clasping a withered wreath of gra grass and flowers to her chest. She looks like she's been crying. Standing in front of her are three horrifying old hags. Markle sits at her feet like a faithful dog. And what's so wrong with us, child? The old woman's skin is even whiter than her hair, and her breath hangs in the air like an icy mist. Her voice is cold or is kind, but her gentle words lack sincerity. Beneath her friendly exterior, she has cold and ruthless as ice. We do not wish to bring any harm to you or your brother, but unfortunately you have not given us what we are owed. Deliver to the river what is rightfully ours, and both of you can leave in peace. You're always too soft, La uh, Lavixia. This hag's voice sounds like the roar of the wind during a storm. Her skin is covered in the spidery blue veins, and her eyes flash like lightning. Do what you're told, last hand over that wreath or face the consequences. You won't escape us. You can run, but you can't hide from old Latinda. Lorenda, Let uh, Lavixia, my sister, do you hear me? Do you know what is destined to happen? Must happen. The old woman speaks in a whisper. Her blind eyes are as cloudy as the fog on the river, but she turns and points her fingers at you resolutely. Look who has arrived. This is the one whose face was revealed to us in the dark waters. He's arrived already. Well, that is a surprise. The old woman clucks approvingly. We dislike uninvited guests, but you're clearly strong, agile, and smart. We appreciate those qualities in a person very well. Since you're here, you might as well come in. Ah, uh, Melissa, are you alright? 
Commander, Aras still be praised. Those those things drove Marco crazy and made him kill my husband. I, I don't understand what they want. Please save us. So you praise the old stag now, ungrateful child, who has kept you fed and unprotected you from every danger. Did your mother worship the old hunter? How about your grandmother or her grandmother before her? Did they offer him praise? I think not. The, sh the hag shakes her hoary head in disapproval. A little village with important traditions and grimaces old traditions that are honored and respected by everyone. Now, why does that sound familiar? Hmm. So, Marco, what's wrong with you? Uh, La Lavixia reaches down to give the man under her feet a pat on the back or a pat on the head. He is absolutely fine. He is a good boy, an obedient boy. He respects his elders, never talks back, and has respect for his mother, River. Isn't that so? Marco's face is contorted in pain. You see the desperation in his eyes as he struggles against the power that seizes control of his mind. Help me. Save my sister from me. The river will take. The river always takes what belongs to her. So who are you? Who are we? Perhaps we are the waves of, on the river, or the fish in the deep. Perhaps we are the mist of the water, or are we so, are we solid ice, or a raging storm? Why do you ask the questions when you already know the answer? Latinda's eyes stare blindly off the distance. I wonder if we already met between the two shores. My sister is wise, but she likes to speak in riddles. Lavixia's icy blue lips curl into an amicable smile. We are the three maidens of the river, generous to those on the water and revered by those on the land. We fill nets with fish and we keep the filth of the abyss away from our people, and we ask for li very little in exchange. Ungrateful mortals, Lorenda stomps her feet. We do everything for them, and what do we get in return? Nothing. Instead of being thankful for our protection, those ingrates have started to praying to some old bowmen. So you've actually been deceiving villagers. They think that they worship the river. They have no clue that they're actually offering sacrifices to three hats. Is this deceit? They pray to the river. Are we not embodiment of the river? They make sacrifices. Do we not accept them? And when they ask for help, do we not help? Well, there's gratitude for you, mortals. Pfft. We stay away, awake all night out of concern for their well-being. We fend off demons so they can feel safe. But instead of appreciating our efforts, they call us liars. If it was up to me, I'd make you. I'd, uh... The hag shakes her fist. You shouldn't insult us like that. We find your accusation offensive. We are not mortal tricksters pretending to be gods. We are one with the river. The villagers have agreed to pay the price for our help. We offered them a fair bargain. The hag glares at Melissa coldly. This stupid girl decided to cheat us. If anyone here has fallen victim to deception, it is us. So what's going on here? I don't know. They did something to Marco. They made him kill Jerna, and then they ordered him to bring me here. And now, th now they want. We don't want much, child. Just your wedding wreath. Give it to us, and the two of you can leave in peace. After all, we have protected you from all kinds of calamities. We have provided your village with food. Don't you think we deserve respect and gratitude for our gifts? Will you begrudge us the one thing we ask of you? Why do you need it? Melissa wipes over a tear. You've killed my husband. I'm a widow now. Why do you need my wedding wreath? Ah, uh, Arcana check. You recall Jernoff's word. When the villagers cast away their wreaths, they promise to give their firstborns to the river. Why would the hags want a widow to complete this ritual? There can only be one answer. Melissa doesn't know it yet, but she must be pregnant with her firstborn child. Oh, interesting. So what did you do to Markle? Have you managed to man take control of his mind? How does the river control a leaf that falls in the stream? How does the sky control the fog that rolls in off the river? We didn't do anything. We didn't have to. He's a boss, firstborn. That means he belongs to us. In fact, he was promised to us before he was even born. We kept him alive because we thought he might prove useful, and we were right. The river is patient. She does not need to hurry. She can take what belongs to her wherever, whenever she wants. That's right. He belonged to us before he was even born. He'll do whatever we tell him to do. Loretta shrieks with laughter. <laughs> I can diplomacy 40. Marco, resist them. Don't let them control you. You must be strong for your sister. Sister. My little sister. I shouldn't. I won't let them. Wait, what's going on? Are you trying to rebel against us, boy? Don't forget, you will belong to us for as long as you live. You cannot get rid of us, no matter how hard you try. We just have to say the word and you'll be under our control. Oh. Oh. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. That's not good. Marco grabs a stone from the cave floor and attacks the hag. You are disgusting crunching sound as Marco smashes the rock at the hag's arm. The hag shrieks and lashes out at the man, dealing him a powerful blow that causes him to fall to the floor unconscious. Kill them, sisters. No one leaves this place alive. Okay. Here we go. This is how it goes, I guess. How it always goes. Alright, Loretta. Die. Oh my god, I'm so strong. I'm actually way too strong for this fight. <laughs> okay, I didn't need to buff up. I was like, ah, maybe we should buff up. Uh, I don't need it. Uh oh. They summon. Oh, crap, deepest fears. Wait, they actually summon people? Boogeymen? <laughs> okay, sure. My head. Melissa, are you alright? Let's get out of here. Hurry. Let's get back to the village as soon as we can. This accursed cave makes you feel sick. Oh, okay. I'm good. I saved them. I saved the brother and sister. Unfortunately, Jorner is super dead. That's Chili Creek. Thank you for saving us from those monsters. I didn't think I was going to survive in Marco. I thought I'd lost him forever. Sister, forgive me. I have no excuse for my actions. It's not your fault, I guess. Those hags were controlling your mind, weren't they? They would never have ensnared me if I had not been such an easy target. I really did not like Jorna. I was against your marriage, and the hags used that to control me. Melissa looks down. After a while, she answers softly. I don't know if I'll ever be able to forgive you, but you are the only family I have now. 
what are, two, what are the two of you going to do next? I'll bury my husband in the ground, and then I'll leave. I'll go wherever the wind takes me. As long as it is far away from this river, I can never want to see this place again. We've, we're experienced travelers. We'll be fine wherever we go. We'll head along the Selen River or toward the River Kingdoms, and then we'll find somewhere to settle. Did you tell the villagers the truth? Do you know that they have been worshipping the hags this whole time? I did, but they don't believe me. <laughs> Melissa casts a glance toward the villain and shakes her head bitterly. They don't want to believe the truth. They say it must have been a nightmare or that Marco drank too much. <laughs> they, uh, they came up with a dozen of different explanations because the truth is just too terrible to bear. They'll keep practicing their rights. I wouldn't be surprised another nasty creature comes to live on the pike fin in a couple of years. I'm sure there are plenty of foul things that would gladly prey on these villagers and accept their sacrifices. I can't live among these people anymore. Okay, yeah, fair enough. Markil, are you free from this evil influence of the hags? I am. The hags are dead. I'm my own man now. Thank you. Melissa, I'm sorry for your loss. Thank you. I loved him so much. I thought we had a life ahead of us. She wipes her eyes. Do you still not understand that why they wanted your wreath? Melissa, you are pregnant with Jernal's child. I'm having a baby. Uh, Melissa runs her hand across her belly pensively. And I was right not to give them my wreath. No matter how much they insisted, if I handed it over, who knows what they have done to my baby. It makes me shudder thinking about it. Well, I mean, they're dead now, so I guess I'm not mad. Well, it's time to say farewell. Yes, Melissa tries to smile. I'll pray to Rastel for you every day. Here, take this. This is an old family heirloom. I don't know how many generations it's been our family, but now I want you to have it. Take it as a sign of my gratitude. I hope it will help you on your path to victory. Thank you for everything. Farewell. Nice. Ah, what a great time. Great time. Happy, happy days. Oh, okay, right. Got a stuff there. Tina, senior remaster. Ah, Commander, good day to you and all that. I'm Tina from the Next Door Theater. Remember me? So here's a score. We finished rehearsing and are ready to stage the world premiere of our play with your exploits. Grandma sent me to invite you. We're ready to get started, so will you come? All right. Uh, <laughs> we're the ruler of the dead in this capital. All right, great. Let's leave now. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Let's go have some fun. <laughs> Let's go enjoy Grandma's play. Grandma Gretlin, the Erector. Grandma Gretlin's smile shines with pride and happiness. Her new ladle uh, shines equally bright, and she holds it like a scepter. L ladies and gentlemen, the day has come that every participant in the crusade has awaited with bated breath. The day when we, the Next Door Theater, finally present to you our newest production. Theater, theater, <laughs> Emperor laughs melodiously and claps her hands. The massive prop catapult behind Grandma creaks loudly and somewhat ominously in time with her words. At least you hope it's a prop. Uh, Grandma Gretlin, the uh, today we return to the recent past one of the first victories won by the commander our show is dedicated to these grandiose uh, incredible mind-blowing exciting large-scale grand and legendary events many of you have probably witnessed firsthand as a director and playwright i feel humbled and honored to captivate her own speech grandma brandishes her ladle with a uh, wild enthusiasm and accidentally touches but only lately one of the catapult's levers uh oh oh that's so nice <laughs> oh wait what the heck happened to that guy Rumble dump the actor. You hear a theatrically loud whisper from the ranks of the actors. Does anyone remember what we used to load that catapult? I have a better question. What did the projectile hit? I see that something resembles a plume of smoke in the place, similar to the one where we let the crates that our props are in. I, I, I put my cherry pie in the catapult bucket to have a secret snack during performance, and now it flew away. The last sentence is followed by a hollow, loud sob. Stop panicking. The show must go on, even if we left without our costumes and props. If something does not go according to plan, improvise. Having whispered those instructions quite loudly to her crew, Grandma Gretlin gives a beaming smile to the audience. Nothing more than a few fireworks to celebrate our premiere, and now we shall begin. Hurrah for the premiere! In the year 4715, in the area around Dresden, a figure uh, in the front of the army waiting his orders. It is their leader, Knight Commander Mickey Mouse. Yes, good old Mickey Mouse. Ah, oh, that's me. <laughs> My heart burns. Lambkin pauses and moves his lips quietly. <laughs> And before inspiring his army with a stirring speech, the commander paused, preparing to say the most important words. Ah, courage, my heart burns with courage, courage, the delighted Lampkin says proudly, and feeling inspired goes on almost without hesitation, we'll never give up, onward my warriors. The commander's speech was certainly inspiring, but he understood it wasn't enough in the face of these upcoming dangers. He needed to describe the goals of the army and give real hope to the soldiers. And so the commander exclaimed, Grandma throws the encouraging glance at Lampkin, and Lampkin throws a pleading glance at you. Yeah, like an arrow we fly to our goal. We rush to the goal, our goal with Lemkin pauses to prepare the last few words and the way uh, others prepare for a race or a fight. Light Seed. Mm, lit, lit Seed is an ancient Aslanti battle cry uh, for and a spell for good luck. Grandma Gretlin remarks without batting an eye. And then, with his army properly inspired, the commander explained the details of his grand strategic plan. As we all know, the commander planned to disperse the enemy's legions by charging them on the back of a huge, formidable mountain goat. Grandma pauses and glances askance at the quite ordinary pony standing near the edge of the stage, a huge but miniature mountain goat of a rare pony-like breed. Are we completely sure Pretzel is up to the task? I haven't been to any of his rehearsals, but he definitely doesn't look like he's ready to ride down demonic legions. <laughs> Not to worry, our esteemed Soundmaster is backstage and will lure Pretzel with a carrot. Our pony can move as fast as a hurricane over a carrot. You would charge a Baylor if any Baylor were foolish enough to stand between Pretzel and his carrot. 
Okay. Hey, my pony. <laughs> it seems to me that something has gone wrong. Do you know how many ponies I had to audition for this role? My entire herd. This was the only one that was any good. He did the trick perfectly for my rehearsals. I don't know why he decides to dig in his heels now. Oh, Pretzel, you've let me down. And now that you've all witnessed the most spectacular, dramatic, impressive combination of our play, let us return to the reality for a moment to welcome the person whom we are all gathered here to celebrate, the Commander. After all, this was one of his earliest adventures. Nice. I got next door play as an achievement. Ah, oh, what a wonderful way uh, to, to see the culmination of their efforts. So what do you say, Commander? Did you like our show? I had so much fun. Of course, sure. Her mysterious smile appears on Grandma Gretlin's face, believe it or not. Commander, but every true comedian knows her calling is to provoke laughter and smiles, not necessarily on stage, and it needs not be a successful, professional, and perfectly organized performance. Sometimes our art exceeds the limitations of the stage. And now, unfortunately, the time has come to say goodbye. We were with you for almost from the first day, and now the show is over, and the next door theater troupe has other places to go and other places to perform. Ah, okay, cool. Oh, and I'm left outside. It's all alone. Well, that's great. That was that was actually pretty good. And um, on that happy note, I think that's gonna be where I end this episode off. Thank you guys so much for watching this episode. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed playing it. And as always, I hope to see you all next time. But until then, goodbye for now. Hit it.